To your video lecture on blood. Blood has many vital functions in the body. It's a complex mixture of cells, cell fragments, and dissolved substances. The average human weighing about 150 pounds would have about five and a half liters of blood in their body. Many refer to the bloodstream, or more correctly named, the circulatory system, as the pickup and delivery system of the body because it picks up and delivers oxygen and carbon dioxide, nutrients, minerals, vitamins, and hormones to every living cell of the body. It also protects against disease because it's where our immune system lives. White blood cells travel in the bloodstream in search of harmful disease-causing organisms. The blood also disperses heat all over the body. Blood plasma is mostly water, and water holds lots of heat. The circulatory system disperses heat all over the body to keep all the cells at the temperature they need in order to do their jobs. And when blood leaks out of the blood vessels, the blood has platelets that react to stop the bleeding. Blood's not just a red liquid. I'm sure you knew that. We can examine it first by separating out its components. This is done by taking a sample of blood and putting it into a centrifuge. That's a spinning machine that spins test tubes and uses the centrifugal force to cause heavier substances to move toward the bottom of the tube and lighter substances are layered on top. 55% of blood is a solution called blood plasma. Plasma is mostly water, approximately 91% of it. The solutes are mostly proteins and then a wide variety of other solutes, including ions. These are your electrolytes, such as sodium, potassium, calcium, chlorine, and other substances necessary for normal cell function. We can find nutrients such as glucose and lipids, gases such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, and of course, hormones, referred to here as regulatory substances. 45% of blood is composed of cells, mostly red blood cells, followed next in number by blood platelets, and then white blood cells. The term hematocrit refers to the percentage of cells in the blood and is often measured in patients as a diagnostic procedure. Here's what these cells look like under the light microscope, magnified about 600 times, and then zoomed in to take this picture. These are red blood cells. They're disc-shaped and thinner in the middle, so light passes through them here. Here are some white blood cells, and here are blood platelets. Platelets are actually not complete cells, but actually cell fragments that have an important job in your body. The term hematopoiesis means blood cell production. When you are a developing embryo, your first blood cells were produced in a yolk sac. This pretty much disappears after about four weeks of development. It also provides some nutrients to the embryo. After the embryo is formed, hematopoiesis is taken over by the red marrow of the bone. Red marrow is found in all bones, particularly in the spongy or cancellous bone. You might remember that there are two types of bone marrow. Yellow marrow, which is actually fat tissue, found in the medullary cavity of the long bones diaphysis. Yellow marrow does not make blood. Blood is only made in the red marrow of the epiphyses of long bone or in flat bone. Blood is considered a connective tissue because its cells develop from mesenchyme, the embryonic connective tissue. Mesenchyme develops into hem hemocytoblasts or hematopoietic stem cells, which will differentiate into each of the blood cell types, erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes. I'll talk about each one of these in more detail. And the clinical name of a red blood cell is an erythrocyte. Here you can see its dimensions. These dimensions are not worth memorizing, but I'll show you them here just for reference. Standard printer paper is about 100 micrometers thick. 
So a stack of about 50 red blood cells on top of each other would equal the thickness of paper. That's kind of cool. A mature human erythrocyte has no nucleus, and these cells are squishy like foam rubber. They're biconcave, which refers to this indentation in their center, and this shape increases their surface area. Their function is to pick up oxygen at the lungs and deliver it to each body cell. The oxygen is necessary for cell respiration, the energy production reaction in cells. In exchange for oxygen, the erythrocytes take carbon dioxide from each cell and dump it off at the lungs. Each erythrocyte has an abundance of oxygen-carrying molecules called hemoglobin to do this work. Hemoglobin gets its name from the iron-containing compound heme. Heme gives the blood its red color and is part of a larger complex called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has an affinity for oxygen and each molecule will hold up to four oxygen molecules. Now, hemoglobin doesn't hold the oxygen too strongly. It actually loses it by diffusion as the cell enters an environment that has a lower concentration of oxygen. Hemoglobin handles carbon dioxide the same way. The average lifespan of an erythrocyte is approximately 120 days. The number of these cells in the body is monitored and controlled hormonally. The liver and the kidneys detect low oxygen levels in the blood and will release a hormone called erythropoietin. This hormone is secreted into the bloodstream and eventually reaches the immature hemocytoblasts, which develop into mature red cells. This in turn helps the oxygen levels rise. The higher oxygen levels then provide negative feedback to the kidneys and liver so that they stop producing the hormone erythropoietin. Like any hormone, erythropoietin targets receptors on the hemocytoblasts, causing a cascade of signals inside the cell that cause it to change and mature. Your body needs plenty of B-complex vitamins and a nutrient called folic acid to make the DNA necessary for the cell division. You also need an adequate amount of iron to construct the hemoglobin molecule. Not enough iron, B-complex vitamins, and folic acid could lead to anemia, which is a condition of low blood cell count. And I can talk about that in another video. Other types of cells are leukocytes, or white blood cells. These are the cells of the immune system. We're not here to learn about the immune system, though. I can cover that in another unit because the way it works is just too complicated to go into here. But I can talk about the different kinds of leukocytes. They're not all created equally, and they have different functions. There are two classes, granulocytes, so named because of the grainy appearance of the lysosomes inside of them. These cells can perform diapedesis, which means that they can pass through capillary walls and move through the tissue to find damage or infection. Three types of granulocytes exist. There are neutrophils and eosinophils. These act as macrophage cells that can engulf or phagocytize and destroy damaged cells or bacteria. They have a lifespan of about 12 hours once they've converted into macrophages. These are the cells that build up as pus at an infection site. Another granulocyte is the basophil, which can release a few different signaling chemicals. Agranulocytes are cells with fewer lysosome grains. The two types of these cells are monocytes that also act as macrophage cells, but can also process antigens. Those are foreign proteins that can be used to make antibodies in the immune system. Monocytes have a lifespan of about two to three days. Lymphocytes are so named because they mature in lymphatic tissue, such as lymph nodes, tonsils, adenoids, the thymus gland, and the spleen. Lymphocytes develop into special warriors of the immune system known as B cells and T cells. Thrombocytes are more often known as blood platelets. These are cell fragments that, like erythrocytes, lack a cell nucleus. These cells function in a process known as hemostasis. And hemostasis is a three-stage anti-bleeding process. 
The first stage of hemostasis is vasoconstriction. This is when the smooth muscles in the walls of the blood vessel constrict in response to damage. Platelets also secrete serotonin, which can keep the blood vessels constricted for a longer period of time. Platelet aggregation is the next step in which the platelets stick together and form a plug. Broken endothelial cells secrete von Willebrand factor, a protein that causes the platelets to stick together to form a plug. This is not a clot. This plug just blocks blood loss. Very quickly afterward, coagulation occurs. Damaged tissues release chemicals that convert other chemicals in the blood plasma to an enzyme called thrombin, which catalyzes the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. Fibrin are those long, sticky protein fibers that stick to the surface of the blood vessels, the blood cells and platelets, forming a clot. Then the tissues can set about the process of repair. I think that's enough for now. In class, we'll discuss more details. And in other videos, I'll talk about blood typing and some blood conditions. Until then, we'll see you in class and be well. Thank you.